um, I'm David Ignatius, columnist for the Washington Post. Forgive that technical problem at the beginning. We're delighted that our guest this morning on Washington Post Live uh, is the Prime Minister of Iceland, Katrine Jakob's daughter, uh, the first uh, head of state to be our guest on Washington Post Live. Uh, we welcome you. We want to talk with you about leadership during crisis, the crisis that you in Iceland and we in America are living through during this pandemic. And let me open by asking you, Prime Minister, Iceland has been a success story for some months, but Recently, you've been experiencing a surge in, in coronavirus cases, and I, I read that this month you've had to order a lockdown. So tell us about this, the surge, and is this looking like a second wave, and what do you think Iceland should do about it? Well, actually, yes, we are experiencing a surge. Uh, we actually call it the third wave of the pandemic here in Iceland. The first came in March, April, and then we had a, a small second wave uh, in August and then now we are in the middle of the third wave. Actually, we introduced harsher restrictions, not a lockdown, but we have introduced uh, very strict restrictions with the 20 person limit and introducing uh, again the two meters between every person. Actually, we're also beginning to use masks uh, a lot more than we used to. And uh, we have seen the closure of, of bars and, and also some individual services. So you can see we, we were actually up to around 100 new uh, infected every day. It's been going down now very, very slowly. So we are actually seeing 60 new cases today. And all in all, over 1,200 people who actually have the virus now in Iceland. But we are using the same methods as this spring, hoping to be able to, to go down again and, and take control of the virus. Prime Minister, tell us about the techniques you used in the beginning of the pandemic, because yeah. Iceland is noted as one of the success stories. I believe that at least until recently, you had only 10 deaths from COVID-19 in Iceland. Tell us what you did uh, and why you were successful in, able, in being able to contain the pandemic so early, and then what lessons you'll apply to this second wave. Yeah, we actually had uh, 10 deaths this spring, and we have had one now during the third wave. So, so it actually shows really how great our health system is really, uh, this death ratio. But it's been a pressure for the health system both this spring and also now this autumn. But what we have been doing, we have been testing a lot. We have been doing excessive testing. So, so we have a pretty good overview really of how the virus is spreading. We have been using quarantine for everybody who is uh, close to anybody who has, uh, who has been diagnosed with the virus. And then we have been using isolation for those who get the virus. Uh, we have been in, uh, we have been working with, collaborating very closely with uh, a, a company uh, that's actually been using sequencing. So we have been able to trace uh, a lot of of the infections, and then we have also had uh, people in the police force working on the tracing of infections. But I think really our biggest. Uh, what we can actually say that we, what learnings we derive from this is that everything we have done here in Iceland is based on mutual trust between people. Uh, so this is not, you know, when you, if you would be in Iceland, you would not experience a country where the police is watching over what everybody's doing. It's really based on a lot of trust between people in society. And we have very high uh, societal trust here. So th that leads me to, to ask a question, uh, obviously, of what in your experience, which has been quite positive, uh, we can learn from in the United States and other Western countries, building trust in political leadership, building trust in science-based uh, treatment programs is not something you do overnight. But, but tell us the reasons that you have this high level of trust and how you work as a leader to maintain it. Well, when you think about trust, uh, I think 
what's different maybe in the Nordic countries, I'm not saying that people necessarily trust their politicians, but they trust each other. So that's really what I mean by societal trust. We have confidence in each other and that's why we see that the Icelandic public as a whole is really taking a collective responsibility in facing the pandemic. And obviously we experience all sorts of difficulties here as everywhere else. Uh, people are tired of the pandemic and, and frustrated because it has had a huge effect on all our lives. Um, but I think we can say about Iceland, and I mentioned our health system here earlier, uh, we have a, a strong public health system where everybody has equal access. People don't pay uh, to get tests for the coronavirus, so that's why we can actually have this big testing, large scale testing here in Iceland. We have very good collaboration within the, the system and also with the private actors. Um, we have um, also taken a very uh, firm decision in the beginning of the pandemic that we would work closely with scientists and we would build everything we do on latest research, latest data. Uh, so we would try to follow really as closely as possible the advice of the scientists in dealing with the pandemic. But we have also learned a lot from other other nations. So I think uh, it has also shown us how important international collaboration and, and collaboration between different people is important, this pandemic. I'm especially interested in social cohesion in Iceland. That sometimes seems to be something that's missing in the United States. I'm sure you have many rugged individualists in Iceland and somebody who doesn't want to be told what to do may go out without wearing a mask. What do fellow Icelandic citizens say to that person to get the person to observe uh, social distancing, mask wearing, safe practices without, without offending that person? Well, of course, we have a lot of individualistic people and sometimes, you know, Icelanders uh, are, are considered to be one of the most individualistic people in the world because there are so few of us and, and, and we have a lot of space for each and every one. Um, but uh, people also, they talk openly about this uh, and um, I think this, what we have seen is that uh, the public health authorities they are, uh, they have been very determined in really uh, being very informative. So I think if you would ask the Icelandic public, what do you know about the coronavirus? What do you know about the pandemic? I think you would see that uh, people are very well informed here and that helps a lot. Uh, obviously, as I said earlier, there is uh, frustration and pandemic fatigue in Iceland like everywhere else, but but people still show a lot of understanding uh, on what is happening because they are well informed and um, and people absolutely speak out if they think anybody is not uh, taking good care of following procedures here. So Prime Minister, in terms of your road to economic recovery, an important part of that is tourism, which requires <laughs> being open to people from other countries who may not be observing the same strict uh, standards that Icelandic citizens are. Uh, I'm curious how you're going to handle that opening to the tourists and tourist dollars you need while avoiding getting uh, contaminated uh, by travelers uh, who, who you're not able to check as thoroughly as your own citizens. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously the tourism sector is huge in Iceland and it's very important for our economy. So these are very tough times and we are seeing unemployment rates going up uh, now uh, and unemployment usually is very low in Iceland. So this is a, a this is a, a novel situation for us. Um, so, of course, hopefully we will be able to to receive more guests here uh, as soon as we have uh, more certainty and really uh, and how the pandemic is going to develop but we have obviously introduced strict rules when it comes to our borders where people are offered a test on the borders asked to stay in quarantine for five days and then have another test and and 
we have seen and we have actually been in the testing on borders we are seeing uh, uh, we are actually analyzing and, and getting a lot of uh, people who are carrying the virus so this is also very important uh, data to build uh, our decision on but the blow for the economy is big and you see that in the unemployment rates rates uh, so it's going to be uh, it's going to be and it has been a tough year but I also think that uh, we are have a very solid we have solid foundations in the economy and I think we are going to recover quickly when time is right Professor, before we leave the question of the pandemic I want to ask you about testing and tracing specifically, which you said was a crucial part of your strategy. Do you think that the kind of success you've had with testing and contact tracing would be possible for a country that didn't have a national healthcare system like Iceland's? In America, as you know, it's more decentralized. Uh, what's ended up happening here is it's kind of every state on its own. Is it possible to run a coherent testing and tracing system in that kind of decentralized environment, do you think? It's difficult for me to judge, uh, but what I can say about Iceland, it, I think it's proven vital that we have a very strong public health system, that we have the equal access for everybody to that same health system, that we are able to have uh, tests who are... Oh my God, there's an earthquake. <gasps> there, sorry, there was an earthquake right now. Wow. Well, this is Iceland. You, <laughs> sorry about Prime that. Minister. I will just right. finish the question. Yes, I'm perfectly fine. The house is still strong, so no worries. Oof, but, but sorry. <laughs> but um, the national health public system, it's essential, but we've also had a very good collaboration with the private sector uh, in dealing with this pandemic. So this excessive testing has been done in close collaboration. Uh, it's been accessible to everybody and, and people have been uh, quite, you know, people are very much aware here in Iceland that if you have some symptoms, you need to get tested. Uh, and if you have met someone who was actually sick, you have to go and get tested. Prime Minister, we don't have too many earthquakes on live television, so I'm just going to ask you to explain for our viewer, viewers what, what just happened. You were wonderfully unflappable, but to tell us what was going on with the noise and sudden uh, uh, shaking. What were you experiencing there? Well, obviously there has been an earthquake, and obviously I would guess that it was pretty close to Reykjavik. Uh, I'm sitting in my office and it was quite, you know, often you get earthquakes in Iceland and you don't even feel them, but this was big. So I'm just waiting for the news to come. So, well, but we have experienced this, you know, uh, and we are all taught uh, when you're children that if there is an earthquake, you go under the table, <laughs> but it seems to have been just one earthquake, but it was quite big. Thank you. Thank you for not going under the table, but you have our permission if there's another yes. quake to, Thank you. To, uh, to protect yourself. So th th this actually is a wonderful lead into what I wanted to talk about next, which is uh, strong women leaders in the world today and the success they're having uh, from uh, New Zealand, where the prime minister has just been reelected. I believe that uh, Norway, uh, <coughs> Denmark, Finland all have women prime ministers. Obviously, Chancellor Angela Merkel in Germany is the leading uh, steadfast figure in Europe. I asked um, uh, the head of the IMF uh, formerly and now the head of the European Central Bank, Christine Lagarde, uh, the other week on Washington Post Live, uh, why it was that uh, women uh, were, were having success these days. And, and she said, frankly, women just do a better job. Uh, and uh, I wanted to ask you what you think this generation of women leaders who are now on the scene is bringing to governance and whether you think there are special advantages that you and other women in, in top positions uh, bring that account for your success. Well, 
you know, first and foremost, I'm a strong believer in having uh, men and women at the table. And I think when we look at uh, our experiences here in Iceland, gender equality has actually been a, a, a leading factor in our economic success. And uh, the changes we made in our policies, ever, you know, if I just take my lifespan, for example, since I was born 1976, I think the changes that we have made have really made it uh, easier for women to participate fully in society and politics. And it has proven us uh, proven to be uh, a success story also for our economy. So I think when we talk about gender equality, it's not just the right and the fair thing to do. You also get better decisions, you get a better economy uh, and you get a better society. So I believe really in the importance of having both men and women at the table where decisions are made and it's always difficult to judge yourself as a leader and I think it's very difficult to do that but I also think that uh, being a leader in, in time of a crisis it's very important to just to admit and realize that you haven't got all the answers when you're dealing with a pandemic and a virus that we have relatively little knowledge of, which is a new factor in our in our world. Uh, we've only been talking about that virus uh, this year, really. So I think it's very important to realize that you haven't really got all the answers, and 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 you have to admit that that. For example, so here in Iceland, Iceland, we have realized that we are together really in this process of learning. And uh, Prime Minister, uh, do I hear you uh, saying implicitly that women lead in a different way, that they don't feel that they have to know all the answers or always seem uh, to, to, ha to have it all figured out? Is, is there a different quality of women's leadership that you can see? Well, I don't want to generalize. And we have many great men leaders also around the world, but I think uh, women have you know they bring different experience a different set of experiences to the table and and they have often a very different view so i think obviously they lead differently but we also have as i said it, it's very difficult to be generalistic but i think uh, that's why i think it's so important to have uh, men and women both at the table and, and tell us a little bit about what gender equality looks like in Iceland. I gather you have a law now that m mandates equal pay to men and women for the same jobs, but does that translate to men and women being paid the same given historic differences that I'm sure exist in Iceland? Well, what does gender equality look like? Um, you know, I have three sons and I actually took uh, a parental leave when I had these sons um, and I think one of the biggest issues for gender equality in Iceland is that we have a shared parental leave system so mother and father actually divide the responsibility of raising the children we have also a very strong uh, uh, early education system kindergarten system for young children so you don't have to choose whether you want to have a family or you want to have a career. And then about the equal pay certificate, uh, that's a relatively new legislation in Iceland, but it means that uh, institutions and companies, uh, private and public, uh, have to have a certificate that they are paying uh, uh, the same salaries for same kind of jobs to men and women. And that, this, is, uh, uh, this is actually a project designed to uh, have a lesser salary difference, but we still have gender pay gap in Iceland. We haven't still reached the goal to have not a gender pay gap in Iceland. But we're going to keep and, on working on it. And Prime Minister, is, is it the case that you also have a ban on sexist advertising in Iceland? A ban on sexist advertising? Well... I had under, understood that. Well... I'm not sure that we have a ban on sexist advertising, but we have been, uh, we have a very open discussion and education on, 
on uh, gender equality. Actually, it's part of uh, being in school in Iceland that you have to learn about gender equality. So, so I'm not familiar really with the ban on sexist advertising. But we have, when we see sexist advertising, we have a lot of very uh, strong people who actually point to that. So we have a very open discussion on, on things, everything concerning gender equality in Iceland. Prime Minister, let me ask you about another uh, big question for Iceland and for the world, and that's climate change and global warming. Uh, and in, in particular, the effects uh, in northern latitudes as we begin to see significant ice melting uh, in the Arctic. Uh, we see uh, uh, receding glaciers um, in Iceland and, and in your area. Could you just tell us what uh, this phenomenon of, of climate change looks like and feels like to you living in Iceland? How do you see it with your own eyes? Well, we had actually a memorial here last year when one of our glaciers was officially declared that he had disappeared, a glacier called Ork. And, uh, and we had a lot of environmental activists that walked on top of the mountain that used to be a glacier. And one of our uh, great artists and poets actually uh, wrote scripture uh, where we remember this glacier. So we are actually seeing this happen. We are seeing the glaciers receding in Iceland. Uh, and obviously it's a known fact that climate change is happening uh, at a faster pace here close to the Arctic. And, and we are seeing also the melting of the Greenland glacier with really, which can have uh, disastrous consequences. So this is a core issue for us. Uh, it's a core issue. Uh, fighting climate change, fighting the climate crisis, as I call it. So we have actually, uh, my government has actually implemented an action plan to fight the climate crisis where we are focusing on not just uh, reducing carbon emissions, but also uh, in binding more carbon. Uh, we're focusing really now on reducing emissions from transport, uh, uh, but also other, factors, other sectors of society. And then we are uh, focused on binding more carbon with both old traditional methods like growing forests and restoring wetlands, but also with new and innovative methods. And I can now tell you that this earthquake was quite big. It was 5.7 Richter, so it's quite big. Well, I must say your uh, reaction was as close to unflappable as I think most of us can imagine. So we uh, we were we're glad that, that you weren't damaged, and we hope that, that the damage in, in Reykjavik is, is, is minimal. Uh, Prime Minister, we have, as you may have heard, uh, a presidential election coming in two weeks. And I'm not going to ask you uh, to take sides in that, uh, but, I, but I do want to ask you what Americans can learn about leadership from your experience and your country's experience in Iceland that might be useful for us as we think about our own country? Well, it's always difficult to take one's own experience and and try to teach others. Uh, but for me, living in a, a society which, uh, which uh, is very dear to me, and I think uh, What's most important for leaders in a society like Iceland, at least, is, is to be humble and, and think and be all, not just in the times of crisis um, and be ready to listen and collaborate with different people. And I think maybe in this polarized world, one of the most important things is to be ready to listen and try to understand what other people are saying, even though you don't agree, because uh, usually people have a point, even though you don't absolutely agree with them. And, I, and what I worry about is really this increased polarization in the world. And, and I want to make uh, my effort to be able to, to at least uh, demi uh, well, be sure that Iceland won't become as polarized as we have seen uh, many places elsewhere in the world. 
So I have a final question for you. It, it may be an unlikely one, but, uh, but uh, I've read that you uh, have uh, begun work on writing a crime novel. And that's of special interest to me, Prime Minister, because I've written 11 novels myself. Uh, and uh, I, it's, in a sense, easy to write novels if you're a journalist, because that's what you do. You write, tell stories. But for a politician, it's, it's different. And I'm curious about how you're approaching this uh, challenge you are living in and leading a, a country. How are you going to write about that country in a novel? Well, this is actually a long story because before I became a politician, I used to write about crime fiction, uh, not spy novels as those you have been writing, but I have to read them. Uh, um, but I, I actually uh, was writing about the history of the Icelandic crime novel before I became a politician. And I have always had a dream about writing my own crime novel. And I think politics is quite a good <laughs> preparation for that. So actually, a friend of mine who is a professional uh, author uh, introduced the idea that we should write a novel together. We will see uh, how that will go, because obviously I haven't had any time since, since the pandemic uh, started here in Iceland. But this is something that's going to take time, but it's an old dream. And I think I will make that come true in some, you know, at some point. And I should ask one more question about your political uh, uh, experience. You're uh, a leader of your country's Green Party, and I believe you are perhaps the only Green Party uh, figure who is currently a, a head of government, head of state uh, around the world. Do you think that, that Green Parties are a political wave of the future as, as, as the world struggles to deal with this fundamental issue of climate change? Well, yeah, I'm the leader of a left Green Party, and I know that there aren't too many of us in, in leadership roles. Um, and I know, you know, in, 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 in it's a difficult role because being in government always means making compromises. Um, but I think it has never been more important to have green politicians, not just in green parties, but in every party, because the climate crisis is really the biggest challenge we are faced with. Uh, and even though we're now dealing with this pandemic, we must not, uh, must not forget that this is a very big challenge that's not going anywhere. So we need to continue our work in that. So I think green politicians in all parties have a very important role to play uh, in the next months and years. Well, we, we look forward to, to, to watching uh, your story uh, go forward. I, th I think I have the perfect opening scene for your novel, Prime Minister. Uh, an Icelandic leader is, is, is sitting in her office when suddenly there's a terrible rumble and <laughs> it appears to be an earthquake, but the Prime Minister handles it coolly and then only later do we begin to discover just how complicated this story is. So. <laughs> Uh, the Maybe spy this novel is the beginning story. of your next novel. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the novelist in me uh, celebrates you. It's it's wonderful to welcome you to 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 be with us uh, today uh, and to share so many insights about about governing during crisis uh, as it's as it's facing you in Iceland. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. So, uh, uh, Wash the Post Live will be back. Uh, later this afternoon at 2 p.m. Uh, for an interview with Black Lives Matter co-founder Alicia Garza, which will be moderated by my colleague, Washington Post uh, senior critic at large, Robin Givon. And uh, tomorrow I'll be back uh, on Washington Post Live interviewing former CIA director John Brennan, whose new book, Undaunted, uh, is uh, an emphatic case uh, the, uh, against the leadership uh, of, of President Trump uh, and goes into great detail that we'll discuss about Brennan's concerns and, uh, and fears about, 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 uh, about, about that leadership. So uh, we'll look forward to that session. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today, uh, and we'll see you later today and, and later in the week.